Side Chapter 47 The Peaceful Alcrum Duchy To the north was the Iron Nation of Marmyuk, a region that was rich in ores to be mined. To the west was the Grain Nation of Yond, the food supply of the empire. To the south was the Maritime Nation of Kalahad, a vital point in the empire's commerce and trading. And to the east was the Merg Shield Nation, the keystone of its defense. Supported by its four vassal nations, the Amid Empire had known peace and stability. Nobody considered it possible to defeat the empire's rule and unite the continent. Even the military officers and nobles involved with the Orbom Kingdom's military, who had to speak optimistically to their superiors in order to be granted larger budgets, didn't truly believe that such a thing was possible. One would have to be ignorant or genuinely foolish to believe that it was. But the situation had changed. The fifteen evil-breaking swords, the secret force whose individual members each possessed the strength of an entire army, had splintered, and the S-class adventurer party known as the Storm of Tyranny now wielded their power against the empire. The new pope of the great church of Alda was a young man, no, it would be no exaggeration to say that he was a child. The one on the emperor's throne was not the wise Marshuxarl, but an ordinary man that nobody had ever previously heard of. A diplomat who served the house of Duke Sauron was standing before Duke Tackard Alcrum now. He alternated between speaking passionately and calmly explaining the risks and returns. The situation, the state of the world, and the times are changing drastically. Duke Alcrum, please make your decision, he said finally, requesting an answer. Hom, Tackard quietly pondered. With a head full of glossy hair and smooth skin that did not sag, people had recently commented that he had become at least ten years younger, but his handsome face was not wearing a pleased expression in response to the plan suggested by the diplomat sent by Duke Rudel Sauron. I have a good understanding of what Duke Sauron is proposing. The proposal itself, the risks and the returns. But I am sure you are aware that my own duchy has its own circumstances to worry about. He gave a signal with a movement of his eyes, and one of his own diplomats began giving an explanation to Duke Sauron's diplomat. Two significant incidents had taken place in the Alcrum Duchy this year, and one of them had taken place very close to the Duke's own home, the resurrection of the evil god Forzagible. Tackard's diplomat spoke of the economic damage caused by this incident and the progress of the projects that were being carried out to recover from that damage. In truth, it was the evil god of cannibalism Zerza region that had been resurrected, not the evil god of pillaging for Zajibol, but very few in the Alcrum Duchy were aware of that. And the reality was that the only damage caused by this incident was the collapse of the sacred wastelands, which had been a nest of mimic humans, there hadn't been any actual damage. Duke Alcrum and his advisors wished to refuse Duke Sauron's proposal, even if it meant they had to lie about these circumstances. We are also aware of the circumstances you are in, Duke Alcrum. But we would like you to understand that we cannot simply leave it as it is. Not when war with the Amid Empire may be upon us, said Duke Sauron's diplomat. What he proposed was not the formation of an alliance and a united army to attack the Amid Empire. It is simply too dangerous to leave the former Scylla territory as it is, especially now that it has become a true devil's nest in every sense. But the Sauron Duchy's strength alone is not enough to address it. We are swallowing our pride and begging for your aid. The Sauron Duchy's sights were set not on the Amid Empire's army or the fortresses of the Mergshield nation, but on the former Scylla territory. I understand that Rudel Dano is fearful of that place, said Tackard. From Rudel's perspective as the Duke of the region, the former Scylla territory was a part of his domain that had been stolen from his people by some mysterious undead. The undead did not come out of the former Scylla territory, but anyone who entered it was killed and turned into an undead to join them. None who had ventured inside had returned alive. Every attempt to conduct reconnaissance using familiars had ended in utter failure. It seemed that there were monoliths and images painted on the ground that tormented the minds of those who viewed them. Every single mage who had attempted to observe the area through such methods had been driven insane. Some of those mages had seemingly recovered and appeared to regain their sanity, but then vanished later, leaving behind nothing but a note reading, I am going to where God is. 
On top of that, one village after another near the former Scylla territory had their entire populations go missing, so it couldn't be said that everyone was safe as long as they didn't enter it. As it was, when the Amid Empire came invading in the future, Duke Sauron would constantly have to be worried about the risk of the undead suddenly pouring forth from the former Scylla territory and attacking his own army. In fact, it was even possible that the Devil's Nest of the former Scylla territory would continue to expand and even reach regions beyond the Sauron Duchy. He had to do something about it before that happened, even if it meant being indebted to the other dukes. I understand that. I do. If I were Duke Sauron, I would be thinking the same thing. But, that place is a territory of the Demon Empire of Vidal, so I cannot make a move there. Tackard thought. He knew the truth behind the former Scylla territory. He knew that the hordes of powerful undead that inhabited it were soldiers of the Demon Empire of Vidal, with whom he had formed a secret alliance. He knew that the territory served as an enclave of the Demon Empire. The undead that guarded the former Scylla territory's borders were not monstrosities that killed all living beings indiscriminately, they were an army with leadership. They would not emerge from the territory and attack the cities and armies of the Sauron Duchy unless Vandalu were to order it. And as for the mass disappearances of the people living in nearby villages, they had simply moved into the former Scylla territory to live there. As citizens of the Demon Empire of Vidal, they lived far more comfortable lives than they had as citizens of the Sauron Duchy. To begin with, it's a mistake to think that something could be done about it with military might alone. If our nation had the military might to take that region back, we would have been able to pierce through the Mergshield nation's fortresses with ease long ago, Tackard thought to himself. The undead army could number in the tens of thousands. He had been told that they were all a minimum of rank 5, and the most powerful among them were of rank 10 and above. If this army were an enemy, the five knights of Alcrum, who were still missing one member, as well as their equivalent secret forces from every duchy would need to be sent in just to put up a fight. And that would not be enough for them to win. It would only be enough to put up a fight. Of course, if it came to that, I would tell Vandal Udano everything without hiding anything, Tackard thought. But even so, I cannot agree to this. Vandal Udano has asked me not to, after all. Vandal U would be attending the Central Adventurer's School in spring. He would have no time to deal with such bothersome matters. The Sauron Duchy was the wall between the Orbom Kingdom and the Amid Empire, repelling the Sauron Duchy army without causing it too much damage would be very bothersome for Vandal U. And because the Sauron Duchy was a region where there were many worshippers of Vida, many of the soldiers were worshippers of Vida as well. As for Tackard, he didn't wish to have damage inflicted upon his own army either. I cannot send my soldiers to die meaningless deaths. There were some among the populace who believed that nobles were emotionless people who thought nothing of using soldiers and conscripted commoners as disposable pawns. But that was not true of nobles who possessed a certain degree of political power. It was true that at times, they had to give orders that sent soldiers to their deaths. Tackard himself had experienced having to order soldiers to venture onto battlefields from which they had no hope of returning alive. But there were always good reasons for doing so. It cost money to train men who dedicated their entire lives to becoming knights and soldiers, and such men were an absolute necessity to maintain public order and security. Even conscripts were farmers, craftsmen, merchants, cooks, and healers during times of peace. They were valuable laborers. Losing such important soldiers in unnecessary wars was unacceptable. I understand, Tackard told the diplomat. But when we sealed away the evil god who was resurrected, the Alcrum duchy lost the knight of the collapsed mountains Goldie, and his entire family, who lived in the sacred wastelands. Our priority is to rebuild the temple of Borgadon as quickly as possible to ensure that the evil god is never resurrected again, and to keep a close watch over our lands so that those who worship other evil gods do not cause us more harm. The truth was that both evil gods had been destroyed, and could never be resurrected again. 
There were also no signs of movement from those who worshipped other evil gods, though there was evidence that they had fled the Alcrum Duchy now that it was a base of operations for Vandalieu. Thus, in reality, Duke Alcrum had no projects that had to be completed as soon as possible or impending problems that prevented him from deploying his army. There was a big fuss in the Farzan Duchy about how Heinz's party, the Five Colored Blades, should have come out of the dungeon but hadn't yet. But that wasn't an issue that could be addressed by Duke Alcrum's army. That was an issue that Duke Alcrum needed to address by using his political influence to gather information. That is why I regret to inform you that I cannot help you. But, of course, I will not hesitate to provide aid in the form of funds and supplies, Tackard said. Because his realm neighbored the Sauron duchy, it was difficult to reject Duke Sauron's request outright. Thus, he decided to at least provide superficial aid through funds and supplies, treating it as a necessary expense. There had been numerous instances in history where the Alcrum House responded to requests from the Sauron House with money and supplies rather than military aid. The diplomat would surely back down and accept this. But the diplomat did not back down. Please wait. In that case, I would like to request aid in the form of introducing some capable individuals to us. Capable individuals? Tackard repeated. And who might that be? From the way you are speaking, I would assume that they are not soldiers of my duchy. The first one is Randolph the True. The first name given by Duke Sauron's diplomat was that of the S-class adventurer who had worked in the Orbom kingdom for over a century. It was only natural to desire the aid of an S-class adventurer, a superhuman among superhumans, when fighting against an unknown enemy that even an army could not defeat. The Five Colored Blades had also risen to S-class several years ago, but they were still inside a dungeon and had yet to emerge. Thus, Randolph was the only one they could ask. He was known to not get involved in wars between nations, but the former Scylla territory was not, considered to be, a nation, so it was likely that if one had the connections necessary to make a request, he would accept it. However, it is true that Duke Alcrum has connections that would allow him to get into contact with Randolph Dono, but is that not true for Duke Sauron as well? And even if it is not, then I believe one could contact him through Marshal Dalmad, one of the diplomats on the Alcrum Duchy's side pointed out in a bitter tone. The truth is, Rudel Sama never met Randolph Sama through the previous duke, so there is no strong connection between them. And making a request of Marshal Dalmad would cause problems in maintaining the independence of his rule, Duke Sauron's diplomat said. This response gave Tackard and his diplomats a clear picture of the situation Rudel Sauron was in. I see. He has already done something to offend Randolph. And on top of that, he's distancing himself from Marshal Dalmad. The truth was that Rudel Sauron had not done anything that could quite be called offending Randolph. However, he had ignored Randolph's advice. Randolph didn't have high expectations of nobles in the first place, and if he were to receive this request from Rudel, he would likely give an exasperated sigh but still accept it. However, when Rudel attempted to make this request, Randolph had been undercover in the city of Morksy as a bard named Rudolph, so it had been impossible to make contact. Rudel and his advisors had misunderstood, thinking that they couldn't contact Randolph because Rudel had offended him. As for distancing himself from Marshal Dalmad, who served the king of the Orbom kingdom, this was true. It was because Rudel was struggling with the task of retaking the former Scylla territory, which was causing people to question his ability as a ruler. In that case, I shall attempt to contact Randolph Dono in your stead. As for whether he replies, that depends entirely on him, said Tackard. But he didn't have any intention of actually trying to contact Randolph. If he were to accept the request and join Duke Sauron's army to retake the former Scylla territory, the undead army there were certain to suffer losses. I must avoid creating cracks in our relationship with the demon empire of Vidal at all costs. Tackard Alcrum and his closest subordinates had seen the demon empire of Vidal with their own eyes when they attended the ceremony to celebrate the completion of the enormous divine statue of Vandalieu and the birth of his first child. 
There was a mind-boggling difference in the military might of the Orbom Kingdom and the Demon Empire of Vidal. People such as Bravatiu and Valdiria of the Five Knights of Alcrum would be capable of fighting against members of the Demon Empire. But only on an individual level. If their armies were to clash, the vast majority of the Orbom Kingdom's army would perish in the blink of an eye, and only powerful individuals such as the Five Knights would remain. More fighting forces could possibly be gathered, such as powerful adventurers and heroes with the divine protections of gods, but as a ruler, Tackard could not afford to rely on such uncertain variables. In fact, when danger closed in on Morxie and Alcrum, they had fled in advance rather than rushing to offer their aid. Even though they had likely fled in order to avoid Vandalio, Tackard could not trust such people. And the difference in military might was not the only problem. The biggest problem was the large difference in sheer power as a nation. It's true that the Alcrum Duchy has a larger population. But does this country have the national power to build a statue as large as that, with little more than just the will of the people? There is no need to even consider it, the answer is no. Its ability to produce exceptional military equipment, its stable supply of food for each and every citizen. The more Tackard saw of the demon empire of Vidal, the more he realized how different it was to his own nation. As for the population, the demon empire of Vidal also apparently included the demon continent, from which the storm of tyranny had returned in what was considered to be the first ever precedent of people venturing to the continent and returning alive, and other distant territories as well. It was possible that its combined total population was actually greater than the Alcrum Duchy's population. To begin with, how did one define the demon empire's population? Did the shadow snipers guarding the walls and the other undead and golems count as citizens? Of course, even without taking into account such undead and golems, its population would likely exceed that of the Orbom kingdom in a few decades' time. Going back and forth is difficult for now. But if there is some method in the future, perhaps if something is done about the mountain range and a highway is built through the former Scylla territory, or some power is used to provide routes by sea. If the people become able to travel freely back and forth, a large number of people will choose to migrate from the kingdom to the demon empire. Adventurers would surely be tripping over themselves to become citizens of the demon empire of Vidal, as well as alchemists and merchants who sought new materials and goods. It was likely that some would be reluctant to go to a nation that treated vampires, monsters, and undead as citizens, but there was no guarantee of that. After all, the demon empire of Vidal already had plenty of citizens who had moved there from the Orbom kingdom. In truth, even I was surprised to realize that I had no feelings of repulsion for the undead. As these thoughts ran through Tackard's mind, the diplomats finished their discussions amongst themselves, and they reached the conclusion that communications would not be mediated between Duke Sauron and Randolph. How about relying on the five-colored blades rather than Randolph Dono? Tackard suggested. Rumors say that they have left the dungeon they were in. In the past, he had abolished the discriminatory systems in the Alcrum Duchy regarding the employment of beastkin in an attempt to form friendly relations with Hines and the peaceful faction of Alda, so it would be unnatural for him not to mention him, no matter how reluctant he was to do so. Of course, he was hoping that this suggestion would be rejected. It wasn't difficult to imagine that Hines joining the battle to retake the former Scylla territory would cause even more chaos and damage than Randolph. It is unexpected that you would recommend them, Your Excellency, considering the rumors that suggest you have recently converted to Vita fundamentalism, said Duke Sauron's diplomat. From his perspective, he did not believe that Tackard currently had good relations with the peaceful faction of Alda, whom Hines was the leader of. Indeed, ever since the reforms that led to ghouls being recognized as a race that was created by Vida, relations with Alda's peaceful faction had grown colder. They were showing no visible signs that suggested this, but that was precisely why Tackard sensed the distrust and wariness that Alda's peaceful faction felt towards him and his advisors. But the fact that this had also been picked up by Duke Sauron's advisors meant that Tackard was out of the woods for now. Tackard almost lowered his tense shoulders in relief. But what came next was a bombshell that was far greater than everything else that had been discussed so far. 
More importantly, as the worship of Vida is flourishing in the Sauron Duchy, we would like you to introduce us to Honorary Countess Darcia Zackert, who is praised as Vida's incarnation, and her son Vandal Udano, the patron saint of transformation equipment, the diplomat said. But this bombshell didn't stop there. Honorary Countess Zackert is a hero who sealed away an evil god and is able to summon a familiar spirit of Vida upon herself, I am sure that a visit from her would bring much comfort to our people. And her son, who is an extremely skilled craftsman and commands numerous exceptional familiars, may be able to find out what is happening in the former Scylla territory. I believe that one of the familiars that serve him is a Scylla, in fact. Tackard and his diplomats were unable to discern the true intentions of the diplomat, of Rudolf Sauron, the one who had sent him. Perhaps he had sensed something, or perhaps he hadn't. But this diplomat's words were sure to offend Vandalyu if he were to hear them, and the fact that Rudol Sauron was allowing his diplomat to speak them made it clear that he had not learned the truth about who Vandalyu was. We are also considering contacting the Adventures Guild to request the aid of the party of the magical girl Kanako Tsuchiya, as well as the Flying Sword and Iron Cat who have recently begun to gain the people's attention. I hope you do not mind? The diplomat continued. Kanako and the others all belonged to the Adventurers Guild, there was no law that made it necessary to gain the permission of the Duke or the government officials serving him before hiring them. However, hiring multiple capable adventurers who were based in another duchy without prior permission had the potential to cause misunderstandings, so there was an unspoken agreement that discussions would take place beforehand when doing so unless the matter was extremely urgent. Tackard and his advisors silently thanked their predecessors for establishing this unspoken agreement. Thanks to them, they would be able to prevent this from happening. I apologize, but Darcia Dano's son plans to begin attending the adventurer's school in Orbom Central in the spring. She intends to go with him, and although I would need to confirm this, I believe that magical girl Dano, as well as his apprentices, the Flying Sword and Iron Cat, are very close to them and intend to go with them, as well as his friends, the Heart Warriors Brigade. Darcia Dano is but an honorary noble, but it is truly embarrassing that I cannot do much about the whims of the nobles of my own realm. Ha, huh, Air, what do you mean by? Duke Sauron's diplomat uttered in bewilderment, seemingly not having expected to have every single request refused. As Tackard and his diplomats worked together to give explanations and try to play it off, Bravatiu leaned in to whisper in Tackard's ear. Tackard held out his ear, wondering what it was that Bravatiu had noticed. My lord, perhaps this is a plot by Rudol Sauron to sow discord between us and Zakert Dano? No, perhaps he intends to whittle down our army's numbers, and then carry out something nefarious. Bravatiu whispered furiously. It was a conspiracy theory. I do not mean to say that this is an adequate replacement, but I shall send some of my most capable knights to aid you, Tackard told Duke Sauron's diplomat. My lord? Bravatiu exclaimed in surprise. It seemed that it would be difficult to preemptively prevent Duke Sauron's attempt to take back the former Scylla territory. With that being the case, it would be best to send his own people to provide inside information, share that with the demon empire of Vidal, and defeat Duke Sauron's army in a reasonable manner. Although he was a little irritated by his overly suspicious subordinate, this wasn't a decision that Tackard had made out of temper. Ah, my life would have been so much easier if I were an earl rather than a duke, he thought wistfully. It was another ordinary day in the city of commerce that was ruled by Earl Morksy, who was blissfully unaware of the exhausted Duke Alcrum's wish to trade places with him. Tama and Gyoku, who had translucent white bodies, adorable round eyes, and long legs, were cooking at a food cart in a back alley of the Red Light District, which was now known as Vita Street, in Vandalia's stead. Rock, the leader of the Iron Boulder Brigade, a party of adventurers who were based in this city, was walking past. So, this food cart's finally being operated by familiars now, he said with a dry laugh. I don't know whether I should be impressed that he's such a skilled tamer that he can have his familiars prepare food, or surprised that he'd be willing to leave the whole food cart to them. Hey, guard, is that allowed? There's a maid sitting behind the food cart, but she's not a tamer or anything, right? One of Rock's companions said. 
the city guard he was talking to, the novice city guard who had finally become able to see two characters of his divine protection, gave a dry smile. There's no problem. The supervision of tamers is under the jurisdiction of the tamers guild, and there's an unspoken agreement to leave matters related to the red light district to starving wolf security unless something really big happens. So that means that everything's up to Vandalio, huh? He's the starving wolf's boss, after all, and the true ruler of the red light district. When we first met him in a devil's nest, I didn't think he'd become such a big shot. No, maybe he was already a big shot back then? Rock's companion. Don't sweat the details, said Rock. So, you'll have a grilled squid skewer for now? The ingredients served on the food cart skewers changed from day to day, and today's main ingredient was the squid monsters that appeared in Garrus's ancient battleground. Incidentally, the maid sitting behind the food cart wasn't Rita or Saria, but the vampire zombie maid Magisa, who had been one of the purebreed vampire Burkind subordinates when she was still alive. It was possible that people seeing the food cart for the first time would be frightened to see it being run solely by high-rank monsters. Vandalyu had stationed Magisa here to stop them from being afraid, people would be reassured to see the monster's tamer watching over them. The truth was that she wasn't even a human, let alone a tamer, but even Rock wasn't aware of that. The only one who knew the truth was Earl Morksy. Is this really allowed? I mean, those guys are grilling squid, Rock's companion questioned. Well, they have a lot of legs, but it would only be cannibalism if they ate octopuses. So it's fine, isn't it? Said Kest. Huh? Those guys aren't squids? To be precise, they were krakens, floating little krakens. They were miniature krakens whose torsos were about the size of a human body, and they were capable of floating lightly above the ground. Though they were related to squid and octopuses, they were another species. Thus, this wasn't cannibalism, to give an analogy, it was the same as a lion eating a tiger not being considered cannibalism. Incidentally, Tama and Gyoku's parent, who had been turned into an undead and resurrected as a little kraken zombie, was behind the cart, cutting the squid, putting them on skewers and covering the skewers with sauce. Magisa was in charge of pretending to be their tamer and handling payment. The three rat sisters, Maroru, Yurumi, and Suruga, were working as waitresses. One of them squeaked at Rock to ask for his order. Give me six squid skewers. One for the nice guard over here, said Rock. Huh? No, you don't have to worry about me, said Kest. Come on, it's fine. Your shift is over, right? This won't count as a bribe, so quit your worrying. With another squeak, the rat sister, who was balancing her three-meter-tall body on her hind legs, skillfully used her front paws to write down the order. If one didn't look at her head, she would resemble a bear. No ill-mannered drunkards dared to cause trouble at this food cart now. Compared to a year earlier, public order in Morksy's red light district had improved dramatically. Meanwhile, the person responsible for improving that public security, the starving wolf Michael, also known as Miles, was currently battling against a mountain of documents. Phew, personnel management is a lot of work. Instead of having a main office and branch offices, why don't we open offices in every city and exchange documents? Said Miles. In human societies, there are no goblin communication devices, golem faxes, and no Guffedgarn or Jane to rely on, a demon king familiar replied. Doing that would drastically increase the labor required, as we'd have to carry the documents between the offices. Well you could do the work there, boss. You can record any kind of document, can't you? Your boss is not impressed by your suggestion of using him as a fax machine. The Demon King familiars were helping Miles with the paperwork, holding writing tools with their tentacles. It seems that a few worshippers of Alda were protesting and singing hymns in the plaza in Alcrum, said Miles. Though from what I heard, nobody paid them any attention. By hymns, you mean those songs that call for the rejection of Vita's races, don't you? 
I have to wonder, did they really think that they would receive any support by singing those kinds of songs in Alcrum's Plaza? Said the Demon King familiar. Even before Vandalia's arrival in the Alcrum Duchy, many of its people had supported the peaceful faction of Alda. There was little chance that they would suddenly start supporting Alda's extremist faction, but... I suppose they thought that it would be better than doing it in Morksy? Said Miles. So, they were not reckless enough to challenge Kanako to a battle of musical performances, the Demon King familiar agreed. Still, these worshippers of Alda had taken the idea of protesting through music from the concerts held by Kanako and the others, so the protests themselves were peaceful. The problem was the other worshippers who shared their radical beliefs. The arson attempt on the Tamers' Guild, the attempts of violence on our security personnel, the attacks on me and Kanako and the others, the attempts to get into your house. People who act on their own are actually quite troublesome, since you can't hold any organizations responsible, said Miles. As the reforms announced by Duke Alcrum came into effect, the radical worshippers' crimes had grown more extreme. Well, it also makes it easier because there are no complaints when we handle the incidents crudely, said the Demon King familiar. As a result of their reckless actions, such as attacking Miles and Kanako, and attempting to sneak into the house that Vandalyu had turned into a haunted house, the radical worshippers had their existences erased from the city. They had then been brainwashed, replaced with fakes, or had just the contents of their brains replaced before being released into the city as if nothing had happened, and their sentences were decided after that. Those sentences depended on the crimes they had committed, but, those whose existences had been erased had all committed crimes that would see them branded as criminal slaves or executed by the Alcrum Duchy's laws. Why would people who worship a god of law proactively break the law themselves? The Demon King familiar wondered out loud. I'm sure they only care about obeying the laws they believe are correct, said Miles. More importantly, the move the peaceful faction made is so impossible to understand that it's creeping me out. And all they did was send letters to you, Darshia Sama, and Kanako. Enemies that only show quiet movements in public are the most troublesome, the Demon King familiar agreed. By the way, boss, what is your main body up to now? Asked Miles. I'm currently clearing a dungeon on the Demon King's continent with twisted space. It's the kind of dungeon where you can be walking down a corridor, then suddenly be falling towards your right, and then find yourself slammed against the ceiling. It's not too late for you to join us, if you'd like. Pass. Let me know when you're doing a simpler dungeon that'll give me a break from all this work.